So, um, hello. Uh, this is a session about best practices for diagnosing and caregiving for prion diseases. And I have my three contestants here, it's a bit like blind date. I've got my questions <laughs> to ask. And uh, I've decided to um, base the questions really partly to start with on what happened at some of the feedback yesterday. So to begin, uh, many of you expressed quite a lot of concern um, about the fact that people presented to neurologists with admittedly relatively non-specific symptoms at that point uh, with a potentially wide differential diagnosis and so a lot of uncertainty as to what was wrong and about the communication of that initial uncertainty. So my question to contestant number one is how, how would you approach that? So just to rephrase the question, so when can people hear me okay? Um, so to rephrase the question, what about the diagnostic uncertainty when... Um, how, how do you deal with that phase of initial diagnostic uncertainty and how do you communicate that in the best way possible? Uh, Given that yeah. people are quite often unhappy right. about it. So, uh, so, when, um, so I run a center at UCSF where we're referred patients with all forms of dementia, ataxia, neurologic symptoms, and in particular conditions that have a very rapid spread. And even if we're strongly convinced that something is prion disease, and that would be based on the rapidity of clinical symptoms, the pattern of clinical symptoms, is there problems with the patient's thinking, do they have certain features with their movements that are abnormal? Uh, those things would make us suspicious of prion disease. And then, as Dr. Beatsy and others mentioned in the last session, the spinal fluid and the MRI could be very supportive also of the diagnosis. But we never want to be, we're human and we can make mistakes, so we try to be thorough when telling somebody that they do, that we think that they have a diagnosis of prion disease. So we usually do other tests to rule out other categories of diseases that might mimic prion disease. So sometimes other neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease or atypical forms of Parkinson's disease can sometimes present very rapidly. In, in, in overlapping with some of the features and the time frame that prion disease occurs, so we want to make sure that those have been ruled out, infections, autoimmune diseases, um, so some of which Dr. Cashman and others study can also mimic that. So um, I, I guess I didn't quite, that's sort of the, how we do it, but in terms of the uh, diagnostic uncertainty, all we can say is the MRI has a sensitivity of probably in the mid-90 percentile. The um, and the specificity, meaning if it's positive, how likely is it that it actually is prion disease? And the spinal fluid biomarkers are getting better as well. So we can provide numbers, and usually we're in the high 90 percentile. Uh, I know um, for our center, we have an 85 percent autopsy rate, and we've never called something, uh, a condition, prion disease, and an autopsy been wrong. But it's hard because at some point we are going, the data might mislead us. So there's always that slight degree of uncertainty. So um, Brian O'Neill, do you want to? I was particularly interested from the comments yesterday that although what you said is true, people quite often expressed dissatisfaction about the way that their neurologist had dealt with that uncertain period. Yeah. So if, if I could just comment on this. Is this on? Yeah. OK. Um, so it's. It's a terrible situation to be faced with somebody in your clinic or in the hospital who you think might have prion disease and how to communicate that, how to manage it. Well, as, as, uh, as was said, you want to be, you know, as thorough as possible, but if... Um, if you do make a mistake and announce the diagnosis um, before it's 
you know, 95%, then um, that has devastating uh, consequences for a patient and a family. So we, and you know, perhaps I'm, I'm saying something that should be a trade secret, but what you want to know is yes or no. And we tend to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until, until we're sure. And before then, it's, uh, I don't, you know, I'm not sure what this is. We'll get to the bottom of it. You're in the right place. All these sorts of, you know, phony reassurances um, until we have diagnostic certainty. And I, I know it's painful, or it has been painful for everyone in this room, but it's also, um, you know, the consequences of making a mistake in that setting are enormous. So I, I actually saw a patient in the emergency room, or I'll say a subject, who had a, um, uh, familial prion disease mutation. She knew she had been tested. One of her parents had died of it. Um, so I do. I listen to her story. Yeah, I have really bad headaches, and I'm worried that I'm starting to develop Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. So I say, oh, that's not a typical um, presenting symptom. But then on neurologic exam she had some abnormalities. So, um, and in fact, all she had was hyperactive reflexes. And that can be from anxiety, that can be from, you know, a number of things, uh, being a young, slender woman, for example. Uh, this woman had two kids at home and, you know, was so what am I supposed to do in that situation? I'm, I'm, I did not get an MRI. I told her, this is not Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. If you have any more questions, here's my card, here's my cell number, you call me and we'll talk it over. But um, I didn't want to even subject her to a workup. So that may be avoidant. Some of you may feel that's avoidant. But the, again, the consequences are so severe, it's not a good idea to follow your curiosity. So maybe you could comment on that. So Richard, you should be here actually, you know. It's, uh... Well, I don't, I mean, I certainly have recently been approached by somebody who was known to be at risk of uh, CJD, uh, who turned out to have a completely different neurological illness. And so one, even with people who you might be expecting to make a diagnosis of CJD, it doesn't unfortunately prevent them developing an entirely different neurological disease. If I come back to, to Brian, maybe, one of the difficulties is that people may present with features of anxiety and depression with neurodegenerative disease uh, as part of the illness. Um, and again, one of the themes that came out yesterday were people said things like, they said it was just anxiety or just depression and we were dismissed. And I think there is a difficulty that, um, I think anxiety and depression are very reasonable diagnoses and I presume Brian wouldn't disagree with me, <laughs> but they're not to be dismissed. I, and I think that's a difficult issue that people regard primarily psychiatric terminology as being dismissive. I don't know if you want to comment on that aspect, Brian. You know, there's a lot of problems with psychiatry in general. I think part of the problem is the nosology. So things like depression and anxiety, uh, they're used in common parlance to describe emotions. They're also clinical symptoms. And then there are also diagnostic etiologies. And uh, I think you have to approach it as such. And uh, uh, there are a lot of different reasons for psychiatric symptoms, psychiatric uh, conditions are one, but obviously in our field we see it as a presenting symptom for things like prion disease, Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I, I think it goes back to you know how do you communicate uncertainty is you have to deal with the patient and kind of get an understanding of what they want to hear, what would help them, what they don't want to hear, and then uh, you know provide them reassurance that you're taking them seriously and what you're doing uh, in order to do that. <clears throat> 
I, I think that that's uh, a common theme. I guess none of you would disagree with this, that uh, patients like to feel they've been taken seriously and their doctor cares about them, whatever the diagnosis or uncertainty is. And it, it seems that that's not always communicated well. well. Yeah, I, I think another thing to add to that is you're, you have up here people who are experts in prion disease. And so when we make a diagnosis, we feel pretty confident because we've seen many cases and we know what it looks like. Um, sometimes, you know, we can walk into a room, just talk to a patient for a minute, and already the diagnosis is pretty clear. But that's because we've had so much exposure. And if I see a patient, for instance, with ALS, uh, um, I don't have that, as much experience with ALS. And so if I saw a patient that I thought was ALS, before I would ever tell them that was the diagnosis, I would refer them to somebody like Dr. Cashman who has seen uh, many ALS cases. So if a doctor, and CJD is so rare that it's very, it's most doctors, um, and they're, most of them are in the room, uh, in the country don't ha who have seen a lot, um, most doctors just haven't seen that many cases. So they might want to refer to one of us in the room, and there aren't that many of us. So. That, that also can lead to uncertainty. You don't want to give a diagnosis for which there is absolutely no cure, no treatment, until you're more certain. So that's why you delay, you get more data, and it becomes more and more clear, which is, of course, very frustrating for not only the doctor, but, of course, for the, the family and the patient. But, but presumably, then, best practice is if someone is uncertain as to what's wrong with somebody, one thing they could do is seek further advice from Absolutely. somebody else Absolutely. in an appropriate area. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, obviously, the diagnosis is also made late in many cases. That came up quite a lot. Um, and I think in the UK, it's still the case, despite the diagnostic methods we have available, that the illness is diagnosed late. Do you, do you want to comment on late diagnosis? And yeah, we published a paper a few years ago um, called, uh, I think it was Diagnosis of Human Prion Disease. And what we found in our cohort was that by the time prion disease became sus not only uh, suspected, but the leading diagnosis, patients were already two-thirds of the way through their disease course. So it really is taking much too long. And by the time that happens, patients are very debilitated. So if we did have a treatment today, even if it were effective, that probably would be too late. So a large part of my research, my efforts have been to, and, and others in the room, have been to try to make earlier diagnosis. Um, and just what we heard with the E200K from um, Dr. Zanuso today of trying to um, look at ge genetic families to see if we can find markers there that might help us diagnose disease earlier, and maybe we can apply those to general populations or certainly to the sporadic form as well. But part of, you can't do all tests on everybody when they first present, and part of the process is indeed the passage of time. I presume that you would agree, the evolution of illness over time. Do you, do you want to make any comments, either of you, about the passage of time as a diagnostic tool? Or? So you're looking at me? So, yeah, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll, I, I think one very important important issue has arisen, which I meant to talk about when I was talking earlier, which is there is no treatment for CJD, no effective treatment for CJD. So that was the case in ALS before the medication Riliazole was discovered. Riliazole isn't a whole lot to write home about. It slows down the disease about 10%. Um, a number of adverse effects, but it just the very availability of such a medicine made us um, quicker with making the diagnosis because it had a treatment um, consequence. So if you, if you make the announcement, well, it, it looks like it's the beginning of ALS and you know this is not a, a good thing to have, uh, but we have a medication, and if you want to, you can take it. Now, here are the benefits, here are the risks. It puts the patient back in the driver's seat, the patient and his or her family, uh, about 
you know, getting some control over the situation. Riluzol is a very wimpy drug, but it does uh, it it does provide you know an opportunity for a decision, and it did accelerate the diagnostic process in in ALS. Brian, do you want something? If I could just comment on your last point. Um, you know, they call it the art and practice of medicine for a reason. Right? So we yeah. hear it a lot today about biomarkers and MRIs and RT quick, and, and those are very important things. But um, for a physician to know to order them, they have to have a clinical suspicion. So uh, diagnosis of prion disease, as with all things, it really comes down to the patient themselves. So if you have a patient that has a positive RT quick or MRI, but they're getting better, that's important information to know. And uh, I think sometimes we forget about that. We get so mired in the details of the diagnostic test that uh, sometimes we forget about the, the history and so examination. I, I, wonder if I, can, I wonder if I could ask this. Um, so I've seen two patients that had a positive RT quick that it improved. So um, I'm, I'm sure it must have something to do with the center that tested RT quick, but have you seen that as well? Richard, have you ever seen that? Okay. No, we haven't seen any false positives yet. But of course, um, there isn't such a thing as a completely 100% eternally specific test. So, But I think what you um, allude to partly in what you've said, I don't know the details, is that these are technical tests. And uh, they're done in laboratories by real people. and. You've also got to be aware, therefore, that sometimes there can be problems with the test and imperfections in the methodology. Even, even you know, as you'll know, even from things like cervical smears, there are sometimes problems in the laboratories and diagnoses are missed or incorrectly made. Um, so there's always a possibility of something going wrong. We've not seen yet in our laboratory a, a false positive RT quick. Yeah. Mm. So I know the Japanese group has, um, I think they they found nine false positives among around 250 tested. Most of them were Alzheimer's, Lewy body disease, seizures. And I think that might have been the, I don't know if that was the first or second generation form of the test. We've had a positive, at least one false positive, that scarily for us was a patient who had a disease that mimics prion disease, but it's completely 100% treatable and curable. So uh, it's, it was an autoimmune encephalopathy the voltage-gated potassium channel, um, and it can mimic it. We published a paper with the Mayo Group about 10 years ago now where we had 15 patients between our two centers that were referred to us as prion disease. In fact, they came to my treatment trial there. The doctors were so um, confident that it was prion disease, they sent them for my treatment trial, and we found that they had a reversible autoimmune encephalopathy. And now we've gotten much better at making the diagnosis and differentiating them. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we don't want to jump to a prion diagnosis. We want to make sure that we've looked at conditions that are treatable. And I think, as Richard, you alluded to, we can't send every test. It, it's not the medical system can't afford it. And at some point, we have to have a clinical judgment that we've done a reasonable amount of tests We've ruled out things that are readily treatable, and everything seems to be pointing to prion disease. But we do always want to have that little bit of suspicion that maybe it's not. And uh, tests always have to be done in clinical context by clinicians. They always have to be done that way. And I think you don't want people thinking, I don't have to think about this. I don't have to exercise any clinical judgment. I can just send off a test. Uh, that was a recipe for disaster, I presume you would agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there anybody in the audience wants to ask any questions themselves? <laughs> we can repeat the question here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we can hear the question if we repeat. Well, we can repeat it, though. Well, if you say it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm wondering, have there been, has there been much research around the, uh, with holistic health care um, in terms of acupuncture? That's what I do. Um, uh, 
you know, right diet, exercise. Has, has anybody ever studied? Okay. I suppose I was going to ask you what holistic care was, because I think we'd all agree that we try to provide holistic mm -hmm. care. So you're okay. talking about specific techniques like acupuncture and yeah. aromatherapy and things like that. I don't know of any particular research, although a lot of these therapies were provided for people with variant CJD in the United Kingdom without any specific benefit on the disease process, although it clearly made them and their families feel better. I don't know if any of you want to do comment I, on this. I guess I'm also talking about preventive. You know, like, I guess once somebody is diagnosed, you know, we, I was providing a lot of care to my mom. I have been all along, but, um, but once it's, you know, once it's underway, I think it's harder. Um, so. So being from California, holistic medicine is rather popular in our state. Uh, we're a forward-leaning state. And um, I, I will say that a lot of our patients have had acupuncture, they've had aromatherapy, homeopathy, uh, in my experience, I've not seen anything to clearly help. It certainly hasn't obviously slowed down the disease. If um, I think that I put all of my patients who are at risk for prion disease or at risk for any cognitive or brain disorder, I try to make sure they reduce their stress level to a, a reasonable level. I mean, sometimes a little stress is probably helpful. And so I put them in, if they seem stressed, um, I put them into a meditation program. I teach them breathing techniques. Um, and I think those can be helpful. Um, if, if they have symptoms that might be helped by acupuncture, we encourage it. I just make sure that the acupuncturist knows to dispose of the needles and not to clean them and reuse them, just in case. The risk, we think, is uh, it's hypothetical, but um, that's one thing that I do for acupuncture, because acupuncture can be very helpful for many, even though it may not help the disease, it might help some of the symptoms. But I think in reply to your question, I don't think there's been any organized scientific trial study of these treatments. It's on individual clinical impressions, I think, isn't it? Yeah. I think you can borrow a little bit from other neurodegenerative conditions, so we know that you know, having a heart-healthy diet, exercising, making sure you get adequate sleep is somewhat protective for things like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. So, um, you know, one could naturally also do that uh, as a pre preventive measure, as we all should be, right? Um, but there's specific studies in prion disease. So. I will say to that point that in the gym yesterday, there were only three of us <laughs> from the meeting in the gym it was Am Amanda and Brad and myself, so. Some uh, of us found the gym here substandard. <laughs> yeah, even if it was <laughs> um, all medical people, so maybe we, we practice what we preach. We'll turn to a slightly different topic, because the other thing that came up uh, yesterday was the things about end-of-life decisions. So I don't know if you want to um, discuss that at all, your comments on how that should be best managed in a system that I don't understand, the United yeah, States. So. Right. <laughs> Our crazy U.S. medical system. <laughs> that might get crazier. Uh, so I, I think what, I brought up that point in an email to Richard when yeah. talking about this panel was that I, I had a patient recently ask me, why did, why did I go into studying prion disease, a disease for which there's no cure or treatment? Why would you dedicate so much of your effort to that. And that would apply to, I think, a lot of the peop medical people in the room. And as doctors, part of our job is not just to diagnose and to cure, but to treat. And we're not just treating the patient, we're treating the family. And so um, I, the other, I also run our Huntington's Clinic, which is also another neurodegenerative disease that is equally, if not sometimes more devastating, because people have the disease for 30 years, and it's 30 years of, uh, of suffering in, in those families. So, um, but for, I, I think for most of us who are in this field, we find that we can play a role by helping the patients and families through the disease, by trying to mitigate the symptoms as best we can. Sometimes it's medicine, sometimes it's acupuncture, counseling, um, physical exercise, uh, 
uh, anything we can do to improve quality of life. And at some point during the disease, we realize that the disease essentially has run its course. Um, and then I feel my role, I'll let others speak for themselves, is to help families let go and to know when to let go. Um, it's less of an issue with the, I find, of families in the United States, but we have a lot of families who are referred to us from outside the United States or from other cultures where they can't let go and they do everything they can to extend life. Um, and the question I always ask a family is, once a patient gets to a certain point where they are so debilitated, you have to ask yourself, would they want to live in this state? And so part of my role is to, at that point, is to help the family let go and let nature take its course. Uh, and I feel as a physician treating neurodegenerative diseases, that's one thing where I can really make an impact. Because I've seen a lot of caregivers and patients who've suffered because their life has been artificially extended. Um, and there's never a right or wrong answer for that. It's a very personal decision. But I always just want to make sure that the family has been asked that question. Is this what you think your loved one would have wanted? And it might be yes. But Brian, so, but want, that's not. Well, not well. <clears throat> I, I guess practically, um, as soon as we make a diagnosis of prion disease, we tend to refer them to hospice or at least start talking about it until they're ready uh, to talk about it because there are so many useful resources available in hospice in, in the States. Uh, there's palliative care, but also a lot of therapies, not just for the patient, but for the family as well. I think the other thing, too, is um, although the patient's name may be on the, the bill or on the charge ticket, you know, we're really caring for the whole family, right? So they become our patients, too, and a lot of that care is really just helping to educate them and give them guidance, and that's part of why the foundation is so important, because I know it's helped a lot of you guys as far as providing guidance on what to expect and what to do. I suppose I was going to ask you that. When, when do you involve bodies like the CTAD Foundation? I mean, as soon as the diagnosis is made. But, yeah. Neil, do you want to? Yes. Do you want to comment on? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to comment again on ALS and uh, the you know, relentless progression to, to death. Um, nobody's ever gotten better despite what Bud Rowland once wrote. Um, and so I, I regard there are two phases of dealing with a patient and his or her family. One, the first phase is to stress hope you know, there's never been a time when more people are working on ALS and, you know, we're going to open our newspapers sometime soon and see that there's been a, a major discovery to help the disease. Um, so these sorts of, of optimistic things, you know, at the same time as busily managing the patient, not only me, but the ALS team, uh, you know, a social worker and dietitian and physiotherapist and occupational therapist. Um, but then there comes a time when there needs to be a switch, and it's just like a, you know, it's just like a light switch. You go from being full of optimism to uh, saying, well, you know, um, it is, things are, are, you know, in the, in the extreme uh, that no one would have ever wanted. Um, and it's amazing, you know, I've had, of course, those sorts of family members too that say anything you can do and, you know, will you approve this stem cell transplantation in China and, um, you know, and, and raise money out of the community to do these horrendously difficult and painful procedures in other countries. And um, so <clears throat> the problem, or one of the problems with ALS, is not being cognizant of that switch. And uh, part of it is, you know, when we're not cognizant of the switch, the, the patient, the family, the physician, the team, that's when the real um, psychological trauma 
begins. Um, it's easier to say goodbye than to uh, just be uh, constantly art artificially prolonging a life that has little or no meaning. But it is quite difficult, that phase from wanting to make sure you've explored every possible avenue and you're not abandoning somebody to carrying that too far and denying the inevitable, yes. isn't it? Does anyone want to ask anything about that? Or, yeah. My question is a little bit different. Um, I was speaking with Dr. Knight yesterday and we had the opportunity to talk about other uh, trials that were happening and, and I wanted to ask the panel, are you aware of trials uh, right now that are happening in Israel with, um, I believe it's, it's, it's something called Granulix, and I'm reading right here that it's clinical trials for early AD patients and then trials for CJD patients and carriers of CJD-related uh, mutations. Are you aware of these trials in Israel? Uh, yes, so um, the product you're talking about is a natural suitable. It's not approved by any medical uh, company. It's a version of pomegranate oil extract. Um, I'll just say my opinion on it is that the data is not very compelling. Um, it's, I don't know how much the product costs, but it's, there, there's no really great, there's no good data showing that it's that helpful. Um, it, it is being tested in a mouse model of the E200K, the equivalent um, in, by Ruth Gabazon and she started the company that is uh, using that product. Um, I don't think she's thinking of it as a cure-all. It's, uh, it's probably safe, but it hasn't really been tested for safety. Um, my suspicion is that it probably is safe, and it's probably not, um, doesn't have any efficacy. Um, that's sort of my uh, opinion on it. And there just hasn't been enough science to say whether it is or is not effective. Um, yeah. And to my understanding, it's actually not a clinical trial going on. Right? Yeah. yeah. In my understanding, it's not actually a clinical trial going on. It's just something that's being investigated in animal models. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then it's being offered to patients to take it, but there's no scientific methodology exactly, as Dr. Appleby said. Okay, so we've got a time for a couple more questions before moving table. Uh, I don't know, I can't see. Where, Hi. where Suzanne is. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Um, my question is about whether there are any other medications or vitamins or anything that would be recommended as prevention. Yesterday during the genetic meeting, um, one individual mentioned some, alluded to some things you could take to protect yourself, and then during the uh, talk after that, there was some discussion about doxycycline in pre-symptomatic individuals. So I was just wondering, is there any, are there any recommendations, or is there any harm to taking things, um, and what are your I, thoughts on that? I think the, the, the only answer I can give about efficacy and harm is that unless you study drugs over time, you can never really be sure. So the question I think you're asking the doctors and the panel is despite clear scientific evidence of its utility or harm, would you recommend anything? Yeah. So um, it, there have been times during my practice where a medication was being studied or purported to have efficacy and I would try it. So for instance, when doxycycline was published, I began putting some of my patients on that. And um, my patients, families, and myself, we never noticed any benefit. Uh, it's now being studied as, I think you've heard already, in uh, an FFI family in Italy as a, uh, in pre-symptomatic patients to see if it can delay onset um, but the trial that Stefan Haik um, was the first author on in France and Italy showed that it had no benefit in symptomatic patients. I've stopped offering it or giving it to uh, families just because I, I think that there's no data. I'm not convinced by any data suggesting that it is efficacious. I try to put all of my patients, as Dr. Appleby mentioned, into a 
heart healthy lifestyle. So what's good for the heart is good for the brain. I try to, if there's a lot of stress, I try to make sure that we're doing something to reduce stress. A healthy diet, active cardiovascular exercise, those are the things that I do. And I, um, if they do want to try supplements, I try to make sure that uh, they're made in the country, that they're at least in reputable labs. In California, they looked at herbs um, from China, and I think at one point, 20 percent of the herbs uh, in San Francisco were, had toxins in them. Um, so if they are going to take uh, other supplements, I try to make sure that they're from a reputable U.S. laboratory. And then to the last point of your question, can it be harmful? Um, there are some vitamins, some supplements that if you take too much of it, it can ask, actually cause neurologic damage. So I always want to make sure that I review all of the, uh, not just medications, but I would include supplements in that uh, that a uh, family or a patient is, is taking, uh, just to make sure that there's nothing that could either have drug-drug interactions that might interact with other medicines that might be beneficial or could be directly causing harm. And, I mean, I think in, in essence, we would all probably want to try to include people in scientific studies of treatment so that we could find out whether they were too harmful. And I think outside of that, our primary duty is to make sure that people aren't harming themselves. That's what you're really saying. As for healthy exercise and diet and everything, we should all be doing that, shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> As you've already pointed out, Michael. But, yeah. Um, do you, uh, Brian or Neil, do you want to make any comments about recommending treatments that are not proven? Or we all do it from time to time. But yeah, so we all do it from time to time. Um, and I would, you know, one of the major uh, what pushes for talking to a patient and family is to try to make sure that they're making the decisions. So. One of the things that I, for, uh, for specifically for Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, I say, well, there's this uh, antibiotic, doxycycline, and, it, uh, and there were two preliminary trials that showed it worked, and no subsequent trials showed it worked, um, but it's pretty benign. Um, and you know, if you want to try it, it's OK with me. I'll write your prescription. So, um, but it's, it's interesting. When those individuals are actually making their decision, they're often more critical than we are uh, as physicians. Uh, so, yeah, so that's my comment. Move on. Okay, well, so uh, we're now going to move on to the round tables, eventually introduce it, and you'll have opportunities for asking these three and anyone else, uh, all sorts of further questions during that time. Thank you.